Guys, a number of you have asked questions or made comments about this crazy Sony a7 II sale, so I'll try to address them here. I happen to have one in-house right now, courtesy of the good folks at Adorama, because I asked for their help to reacquaint myself with the camera. And it got me thinking. So, thanks again, guys. Let's get into it. 1. Many of you want to know, when does the sale end? In theory, it ends November 10th. I don't recall what time, which is why I'm getting this vid out today, or tomorrow, depending on when I finish it. But then some of you have also asked, two, will the sale come back for Black Friday or Cyber Monday? Now, I have no idea. Could be, maybe not. I do know that Sony has been selling a lot of these kits over the past few days, but I have zero insight into Sony's sales strategy and inventory levels. Three, is the kit lens okay? Well, let's talk about it. The hard reality is that I personally don't like zooms very much, but the ones I do like are generally very expensive, and that's because the best of them are sharp, contrasty, well-controlled for aberrations and fast. The 28 to 70, 3.5 to 5.6 is not an expensive lens, hold that thought. But in any case, dollar for dollar, 99% of the time, or something like that, I'm using creative license. Even the best zooms are not as good as the best primes for any given focal length, and often not as good as even modestly priced primes. Ergo, my suggestion in my original video, to sell it and apply the proceeds to the purchase of Sony's modest but optically excellent 28mm f2 or 85 1.8, along with the optically very solid FE 50mm f1.8. Though it behooves us to ask, what does as good mean? Put differently, how closely are we actually going to look? And how important are those differences? It's interesting when you peruse DxOMark to learn how this lens stacks up against Sony's 24-74 Zeiss and 24-70 2.8G Master. It's one of those times when the numbers, yeah, they can seem a bit funky. If you look at how the three compare when made it the full frame 42 megapixel A7 R2, there's not that much difference between them, though the differences are clear enough in the numbers. But when you take a look at the three on the crop sensor A6000, a fantastic little camera, by the way, because its APS-C sensor punches way above its weight class, you suddenly see a big difference in sharpness. And this comports with my own experience over the years checking DxO mark data against what I see with my own eyes. I've found lenses scoring below 12 or 13 on DxO mark with a 20 or 24 megapixel crop sensor lens just don't do it for me. When it comes to high megapixel full frame sensors, I look for mid 30s and up. But when I say don't do it for me, I mean that even when I don't pixel peep, I can feel the difference. I develop a lingering dissatisfaction at normal viewing distances. Whereas the best glass makes me gasp with delight or just grin. Could you or I discern a difference of one point perceptual megapixels in DxO mark? N no. Three? Absolutely. I can, under the right circumstances. And your eyes may be better than mine. Then again, if you want to capture your kids during the day, take casual travel shots, even take important shots, but can keep your subject away from the very edge of frame or difficult lighting conditions, and you're not blowing them up to wall size and then standing two feet away from them uh, with a magnifying glass, well, it's a great focal range, the lens is lightweight, and most people probably won't notice the difference in image quality. Ditto if you're doing landscapes at the wide end, where you have so much light, usually, and want so much depth of field that you're likely to hit the sweet spot of the kit lens and the sensor anyway. I mean, how much difference do you see here if all you want to do is see what's in the frame?
But there are other reasons why I'm suggesting swapping out the kit lens, beginning with this. If you are looking to go to full frame mirrorless, a big part of the inducement to do so is shallow depth of field and better high ISO performance, which a variable maximum aperture 3.5 to 5.6 lens of this focal range tends to make more difficult. At 70 millimeters, for example, what you'd use for portraits, you're shooting at no larger than f5.6 rather than the 85's 1.8. At, say, 3 feet, a reasonable distance for a headshot, you'll therefore find your depth of field is about 5 times deeper with the kit lens versus the 85 at 1.8, a little over 2 inches versus a little less than half an inch, which may or may not make a difference to you, fine in either case, but this can sometimes make a big difference to me. You'll be cutting the amount of light reaching the sensor by about three stops. So if you could get the shot at, say, ISO 200 with the 85.18, you'd have to spool it up to ISO 1600 on the kit lens, which is not terrible from a noise perspective on the sensor, which is part of what makes it so attractive. But if you're shooting indoors or you're shooting sports, you might be moving from ISO 1600 to ISO 12800 or higher. Again, this sensor is pretty darn good from a noise perspective, even at 12,800, but the difference in noise will be significant. Perhaps an even bigger difference is dynamic range as you move up the ISO scale, and this is something about which most people are unaware. Photons to Photos has a really interesting database, so let me show you what I mean. In this instance, as you move from ISO 200 to ISO 1600, you're moving from 10.25 stops of dynamic range, very, very good, to 7.58. Going to 12,800, it drops to 4.64. This kind of performance is true for all cameras, and the differences among the really, really good cameras have narrowed over time. Bottom line, all else being equal, you always want to shoot at base ISO. That's why real DPs light and why really fast, high-quality primes always win, in my book. But with all of this said, don't let anyone gear shame you either. If money is tight and you don't shoot at the margin, if you're shooting for your own enjoyment, start with this lens and be happy. You can always add to your kit later. So that's that. Four, is the A7II's low light performance bad? No. It's not as good as the a7 III, a7 R3, a7S or a7S II, but it's better than most everything else. Better than the Canon 5D II, which kicked this whole thing off. And the difference between the a7 II and the very best cameras out there today vary by one half to not quite one full stop. Heck, low light performance isn't an issue for us with our a6300 or our GH5. When I had my own darkroom back in the last century, ASA, who knew from ISO back then, the alternative was DIN, 1200 was rock star fast, and that was only accomplished with wicked arcane things like AccuFine. Factory original fast was Kodak's ASA 400 Tri-X. Now, even Micro Four Third sensors can comfortably exceed that by four or five stops. But how much of the time will you be shooting up there anyway? Because there are incredible concert shots from back in the days shot on Tri-X, but then those shots are about emotions, energy, drama, sex, drugs, rock and roll. You get the point. Noiseless images were not the point. Five, some of you have suggested saving your money and buying something like the a7 III or the Fujifilm X-T3 or pick your other alternative. I understand. There are valid reasons to do this, like superior ergonomics, superior video recording, superior autofocus, superior EVF, superior battery life. The new Fuji X-T3 is killer in all of these categories, maybe not battery life, and has better build quality and, okay, fine, dual card slots to the a7 II single, though it is a crop sensor camera. Then again, crop sensors don't bother me much at all, as I've got a 27 by 40 inch print from its predecessor, the X-T2, up on our wall, and it is gorgeous. I love these cameras. On the other hand, neither one has IBIS like the a7 II does, nor can they isolate subjects through shallow depth of field using autofocus lenses quite the way a full-frame camera can. And these things do matter to me. I also agree that the a7 III 
is a killer full frame camera at a killer price point, better than the a7 II in almost every way. The a7 III has single handedly reset our expectations for performance and value in the full frame segment, making Canon's and Nikon's entries into full frame mirrorless especially challenging. I've spent time with the a7 III and X-T3, and I'll link to those reviews down below and up above. I'm spending time with the Nikon Z7 and Canon EOS R as I'm recording this, and I'll have more to say about them in the coming days. But for now, the real points are these. For some of us, the additional $500 for an X-T3 body only, even before we talk about lens, is a lot of money let alone a thousand bucks or more to move up to the a7 III, again, body only. Meanwhile, you could be shooting with the a7 II, learning, growing, and experiencing what for many will be a dramatic leap forward. In other words, the law of diminishing returns is no less applicable here than anywhere else. For those who worry or assert that the a7 III isn't state of the art or the differences are massive, I can only say, yeah. But let's put this into perspective. When the a7 II first arrived, less than four years ago, the reviews were strong. The II was the first full-frame camera with five-axis sensor-based in-body image stabilization. And it was also Sony's first full-frame body with phase detection autofocus. It was well-received by reviewers. DP Review gave it a silver award, and it sold for $1,700 body only. Back to the present. The a7II's autofocus is not awesome compared to today's best. But since you asked, better in low light than you might think, and more than adequate to anything short of fast action sports. There are too many other scenarios to get into here, and video AF won't be amazing, but hold that thought. There was a significant upgrade over its older siblings that the industry had regarded as revolutionary just one year before. Now, these are all set to program mode, and yeah, the new EOS R is faster, sure. Still wish it had IBIS though. The X-T3, right there with the R. And I'm not even showing you IAF in continuous video mode, which is outstanding. Our Micro Four Thirds GH5 has that signature contrast detect flutter, but it locks on and is even faster when not connected to a recorder. Don't ask me why. The Nikon Z7, I need to figure out if it's AF performance is because of me or the camera. And I still haven't figured out how, or if it's even possible, to output display information. The real sleeper here, no surprise to me because we've owned it for years, but maybe it is to you. Our little A6300, it's brilliant, especially for stills. Then again, the build quality and tactile sensations of the A7 II are not special to me. It doesn't have the latest ports, that matters to me. But your mileage may vary, as may your priorities, and that's fine too. The overarching point is this. In the real world, for many people, these differences will go unnoticed, mattering only at the margins where very few of us live. And as I've said before, especially if you're a DSLR shooter, you'll likely be blown away by the advantages of an EVF for everything from checking exposure in real time without moving away from the eyepiece to autofocusing during video. And then you'll have entree to some of the best glass currently being made. So, get them while they're hot, or not. If you think the a7 II doesn't make sense for you, don't overthink it, you're probably right. But if you think it does, you're also probably right, and 50% off cameras like these just don't come along very often. That's why I've spent as much time as I have on this particular camera. Oh, one more thing. You know I recorded this on the A7 II at 1080-24p, right? If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3bmepthreadless.com store. Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. 
We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevich, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time. <laughs>